Hi, church, and welcome to worship today. We gather together to remember God and to be remembered to each other, the body of Christ. It's so important that we do this every week because the rest of our life and the rest of our world tells us that we're on our own, that we have to be stronger and smarter on our own in order to survive. But even if we can put on a good front, deep down, we all realize that we have limits. We can't be strong enough. We can't be smart enough. We can't control everything. And yet when we let go of control, well, that's when things seem to go wrong. Today we'll explore how God invites us to let go of control and to hold on to who God is and who we get to be as a result. I'm glad that you're here to do this with us. Because this work of remembering and trusting God isn't something that we do in isolation, we need each other. We actually need this body of Christ to remind us of God's goodness, faithfulness, and deep love for us when the fear and pain of sin is more prevalent in our lives. We get to bear each other's burdens. We get to celebrate God's mercies and encourage each other as we journey to be a courageous, compassionate, and curious community together. If you're looking to join others in forming this sort of community, I'd love to connect with you or invite you to join our weekly coffee hour or midweek small groups. If you have elementary aged kids in your house and are looking for a community for them, be ready to sign up for Summer Blast on May 1st. Summer Blast is a week-long experience where kids connect to God and each other every night from 6 to 8.15 at High Rock Arlington. This is open to anyone, so sign up, bring a friend, and make a week out of it. Just as we share our burdens and joys in community, we also share our finances. This is one of the ways that we let go of trying to control everything and practice trusting God's care for our lives. It's an act of worship, remembering that God has provided all that we need for a healthy life, and we can respond in generosity. Partnering with God through High Rock helps support the work of creating Christian communities and standing in solidarity with God's creation around the world. You can connect to community and give your offerings through the QR code on the screen. Let's pray now, giving thanks for all that we have been given and for what we are yet to receive. God, we give thanks for this time together today and for the gift of this community. As we gather together, may we remember that we bear your image and that we are worthy of love and we are able to give love. And yet we also come with all of our burdens, the things that feel so heavy and out of our control, the ongoing onslaught in Palestine, the violence in Sudan, the state of politics in the United States, worries about our marriages, our kids, our futures. God, we give thanks that while we bear your image, we are not you. And you don't ask us to be. May we live more and more each day like your beloved children who live out of your goodness and providence and don't rely on our own selves for our security. May our tithes and offerings be a reflection of the trust that we have in you, realizing that everything we have in our belong to you always and everywhere. So God, we come to scripture together now, seeking to know you more through the work of the Holy Spirit in our receiving of the word in heart, mind, soul, and body. Thank you for the gift of this community and the gift of your word made flesh in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, and 11b through 13. I'll be reading from the New International Version. You can follow along on the screen with me or in your own Bible. Hear the word of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, it's good to be with you today. My name is Taylor, I'm one of the pastors here at High Rock. One of my favorite mottos in life is to under-promise and over-deliver. That way, you're always exceeding expectations. Personally, I have always preferred to look like I've got everything under control in my life. I like to set goals for myself and then accomplish them. I'm not what some might call laid back. I like to say that as long as everything is exactly the way I want it, I'm totally flexible. All of this to say, 
I put a lot of time, energy, and thought into how I navigate the world and how I want other people to view me. And this is basically just a long-winded way of saying, I've got a very close relationship with power and control, which is what we're gonna talk about today, or rather, letting go of power and control. As far as I can tell, I've always been this way. I've been told that when I was very little, I, I didn't crawl, I went straight to walking. I hardly spoke in words, I went right to sentences. Apparently, that about gave my parents a heart attack when it first happened. Now, to hear my mother tell these stories, these are sure signs of my genius. I'm not so sure, though. To me, it seems more likely that I didn't actually skip these steps, but that I practiced the intermediary steps out of sight so that I could present to the world as having everything under control. I've wrestled with power and control my entire life. A few years ago, I was elected to a prestigious position within our denomination, the President of the Covenant Ministerium. And I know this sounds like something out of Harry Potter, but I promise you it's 100% real. Essentially, I was the President of the Pastors' Union. I didn't seek out the role. Frankly, I didn't even really want it. But I'd be lying if I said that after I had it, I didn't enjoy the status and the prestige that came with it. I did feel called to it and I prayed long and hard about accepting the nomination. Yet after a time, I started to sense myself burning out. I was working two full-time jobs in ministry simultaneously, leading both the church and my colleagues, and I began to wonder if I should step down. But I was terrified to admit that to anyone, even to myself. Eventually, I told my wife Rachel that I was pondering resigning. And I had this strange but intense intuition that I should call my friend Sean and talk to him about this. Sean is also a pastor and he'd been in a leadership role that he had stepped down from a few years earlier and I, I felt confident that he would be a great sounding board and a prayer partner in this. He's also a deeply mature and wise person. So for weeks, I kept saying to Rachel, you know, I should call Sean. And she said, yeah, yeah, you should. And after a few weeks in a row of this conversation playing over and over on a loop in our house and me not actually doing anything about it, I could tell Rachel was getting annoyed, mostly because of my great intuition and also because she was telling me she was getting annoyed. Honestly, who could blame her? So I stopped bringing it up and I just put it out of my mind, which I was sort of okay with. I, I didn't really want to confront the possibility that I may need to resign early anyways because I've long prided myself as being a tough, capable person, as being dependable and reliant. One of the things I fear most in this world is letting people down. I feared that people would be disappointed in me, and honestly, I was worried about what might happen after I was no longer in control. What would happen if I gave up power? Would the person who came after me do a good job? Would they reverse the policies and the initiatives I'd created? Who would care for the people and the causes that I championed? Also, didn't God call me into this role? I mean, I had prayed about it after all. Plus, didn't my peers who are pastors themselves confirm that by electing me? Can you be uncalled to something? Is that even a thing? Pretty soon, I had talked myself out of thinking about this and I chalked it up to momentary doubt and I just moved on and focused on other things. I felt guilty that I had even considered this question in the first place. I was pretty miserable, but I decided that was okay. I just needed to get tougher and soldier on. In high school and in college, I ran track and I had this t-shirt that said, my sport is your sport's punishment. So I leaned into that mentality. Have you ever wrestled with a challenge like this? Where you've come up against a problem in your life where you've wondered if maybe the way through is to let go of something, but you've not wanted to? Where even thinking about letting go makes you fearful? Maybe you too have been tempted to just tough it out or work harder. Now, there are situations in life where that approach can work, and oftentimes it is healthy and good to work hard. But there are also situations where simply trying to power through something is actually a means of avoiding something that we don't want to confront in our lives. Or perhaps even scarier, something about our relationship with God that we'd much rather not think about. For me, I was much more willing to follow God's call, even into hard things, so long as it reinforced what I already wanted to be true about myself. But as soon as I sensed God was calling me to change course, to do something I didn't really want to do that might make me look bad, well, 
I convinced myself that I hadn't heard God correctly, that I, I just needed to put my head down and work harder. Oftentimes, when we find ourselves reticent to let go of things, it's because we're trying to convince ourselves that the things were that are actually better than they are so that we don't have to face reality. As people of faith, we can often feel a certain pressure for things to look more put together because we want the people around us to see Jesus working in our lives. And so admitting that we're struggling can feel like we're admitting that we're bad Christians. Now, there's no shortage of crises or challenges that we might face in life that can land us in these choppy seas where we're feeling unmoored, where we're desperate for a lifeline, where we find ourselves desperately trying to control the world around us precisely because everything feels so out of control. So is there a challenge that you've faced or maybe that you're experiencing right now that tempts you to try to cling to power and control? Maybe for you it's a divorce, a job loss, a health challenge, or the death of someone you love, a difficult career choice or a difficult situation at work that just won't seem to go away, or maybe a hope for your life that you've been praying for and praying for and it just isn't happening. Your kids are struggling and not getting better or you really want to meet someone and get married and it's just not coming together. Or it could be something else entirely. For a while, when we face challenges like these, we can tough it out. We can power through, again, for a while. But eventually, eventually our strength runs out and we'll come to an impasse. Or we can try to avoid facing our problems altogether. But again, eventually that strategy runs out of gas. Despite our magical thinking, very few problems in this world improve by being ignored. Now, I have to admit, when I read the scripture text that we read this morning, at first glance, it sort of seems like it's plat platitudinal thinking. I've seen versions of this text written on home decor many times, and in the past, I would often roll my eyes because it long felt to me like a Christianese version of keep calm and carry on. But here's the thing. The Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter to the Philippians, he was not known for trite truisms, and he was not writing this from a space of insulated privilege. No. The Apostle Paul knew hardship. He knew it firsthand. He faced serious challenges in his life and his ministry. He was beaten. He was imprisoned several times. He had to flee cities because of angry crowds who wanted to kill him. In at least one instance, he was stripped naked and beaten by a mob and then thrown in prison unjustly. He, he was shipwrecked and marooned. He had to fight off wild beasts. Many times, the very people whom he helped lead to Jesus turned on him, betrayed him, and made false accusations against him. And sometimes, they even left the faith. And if all that wasn't enough, Paul wrote this letter, this very text, from a prison cell. So I've got to ask, how does someone who has gone through all of that, who is still in the midst of all of that, write that he has learned to be content, whatever the circumstances? Well, Paul himself tells us how. He wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Without a careful reading, it would be pretty easy to dismiss this because on its face, it does kind of sound like a fairly simplistic solution. Going through hard times, struggling to let go of power and control, well, just pray. Now, I don't even need to, need to be cynical, but I've been through some rough seasons in my life before, and on more than one occasion, someone has made the comment that, they, that implied that they thought that if only I had prayed harder or more diligently or more something, that my problem wouldn't exist. So just being honest here, I have a defensive reflex an impulse within me that comes up whenever I hear Christianese sounding solutions that paper over the problem or blame the victim or over spiritualize something. There are situations in life where we can do everything right and things are still hard. 
But this isn't what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He isn't papering over things. In fact, he is doing quite the opposite. Paul says that we are to rejoice always. It's so important, he even says it twice. And maybe this sounds simple to some, but there is something profound about approaching God in prayer with a posture of rejoicing, about beginning from the supposition that God is good and worthy of praise even, or perhaps especially if and when, we're struggling. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying it's important. Now, Paul goes on to say that we're to let our gentleness be evident to all. And this sounds like decent advice, but it still kind of sounds like be happy and play nice with others, which is all well and good, but feels kind of unhelpful when we're in a challenging situation clinging to control because we're desperately trying to keep things together. Yet, the Greek word that Paul uses for gentleness has a very specific connotation. When we use the word gentleness, we, we typically associate things like soft or tender or quiet. But the word that Paul uses is really much closer to be considerate, be tolerant, practice forbearance, or perhaps we might say practice long suffering. This matters because this word choice isn't accidental and it implies an active and an unresolved ongoing conflict. It's not just about being gentle or meek, although those are good things. It's about rejoicing in the midst of a challenge and acknowledging, as Paul says, the Lord is near. In other words, Jesus is with us in the struggle. And when we frame our approach to our struggles from that foundational truth, it reframes the entire way we view our present circumstances. We aren't alone and all hope is not lost. Now, that may not solve the problem that we're facing, or we may not get the solution that we want, but we are not alone in the struggle. Paul then goes on to say, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What Paul is getting at here are two key realities that would be difficult to overstate. The first is that the peace of God gives, that God gives us transcends all of our understanding. It, just put another way, it simply doesn't make sense. It's beyond our capacity to understand. It does not make sense that Paul would be content with the life that he had. He went from being an outstanding religious scholar who was advanced far beyond his peers. He was on the fast track to a high achieving life. And instead, he ended up poor, often rejected, imprisoned, from a worldly perspective, from a human perspective, contentment, let alone peace, makes zero sense. Yet Paul says, that he has learned to be content in all circumstances. He gave up so much, and yet he has peace. The way Paul found this is simultaneously extremely simple and profoundly difficult. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. If we want that same kind of peace in the midst of the challenges that we face, We've got to not only be willing, but be in the habit of going to God in prayer and thanksgiving. We've got to get honest with God about what it is that we want while recognizing God's own goodness. What happens when we do this is that we'll come to realize that the power and control that we often find ourselves desperately clinging to was always an illusion. Not only is our reliance on clinging to power and control an illusion, but often, it can become an idol. It can become something that prevents us from truly worshiping God. Yet, when we go to God in the midst of an unresolved struggle and still proclaim his goodness, when we're honest about our struggles, those simple yet profound acts of faith can be absolutely transformative for our spiritual health and for our peace of mind. Now, to be clear, learning to be content in all circumstances and a peace that transcends all understanding does not mean that everything will work out the way we want it to or that all of our problems will magically disappear. What it does mean is that when we understand who God is and, what, and that God is with us, that God is for us, and that we aren't actually in control, 
It allows us to navigate our lives with a freedom and a levity and a peace, even when things are hard. It's this kind of posture that allows us to rest in the confidence that even if our present challenge doesn't resolve anytime soon or in the way that we want it to, that God is with us, that God is working in our lives and in our world. Now, praying honestly and gratefully may not fix the problem, but I promise you, it will absolutely change your relationship to the problem. Now, I really can't tell you all this in good conscience without admitting that I get this wrong as often as I get it right. When I was considering leaving my denominational position and I was so desperately afraid of letting go of the power and the control that I had, I had this sneaking intuition that God was trying to tell me something and instead of praying about it or seeking wise and prayerful counsel from my friend Sean, I just tried to put it out of my mind and out of sight. I put my head down and just tried to work harder even though I was fraying at the edges. I can't really explain why I knew that I needed to talk to Sean, but I knew that I did, which is probably why I avoided it so intently. I feared what he might say if I opened up the subject. So I just put it out of my mind and avoided it. Well, as I said earlier, that strategy only works for so long. And so after a few weeks of successfully making myself forget about this whole problem, I woke up one morning to a text from Sean. We hadn't spoken in over a year, and he wrote to me that he didn't exactly understand why he'd been woken up in the middle of the night, but he had been woken up in the middle of the night by the Holy Spirit with a message for me that said that I had done well, I had been faithful, and that I had completed what I was called to do, and that I should go forward free of guilt. I've had a few moments in my life where God has spoken fairly directly to me. This is easily in the top five. We caught up on the phone soon after and I shared with him what that had meant because he didn't know the context. He just knew his assignment. So we gave thanks to God together and in that phone call, he said a few things to me that have stuck with me even years later. He's a wise and seasoned leader and he said that if I stayed past the call, I ran the risk of staying past the grace that God had given me for the call. That was so deeply convicting. I knew it was the Spirit speaking through him again. Because over the previous few months, I had watched as my patience was wearing thin with people. I was having to call people and apologize more and more for things I had said or for the tone I had used. And I realized that if I overstayed, I was gonna seriously hurt someone with the power that I had as a leader. I had to let go. Just as God had called me into the role, God was calling me out of the role. As hard as it was to admit this to myself, I knew I had been faithful. I had completed what I was called to do. And if I continued to stay on, the reasons for my staying would have had nothing to do with God, but they would have had a whole lot to do with my own ego and my desire to be, ser to be seen in a certain light or my own fear of letting go and actually trusting God with my career, my hopes, and my care for the people and causes that I loved. So, I began to make plans for my resignation. Now, I'd love to tell you that everyone was understanding, everyone was kind and supportive, and most people were. But for some, they were disappointed. They did feel let down or even betrayed. Some people were angry at me for all the reasons I feared they would be. Some pleaded with me to reconsider or were hurt that I wouldn't be there to safeguard the accomplishments that they cared about or achieve the hopes that they still had for me. It was painful to hear those things. And yet, I was okay. I had confidence that my calling was never to hold on to power and control for as long as possible, but to use my life to serve Jesus and love others on Jesus' terms, not on my terms. One of my all-time favorite movie quotes is from Father Kavanaugh, the priest in the movie Rudy. He says, in 35 years of religious study, I've come up with only two hard, incontrovertible facts. There is a God, and I'm not him. When we face challenges in life, and we're clinging to the illusion of our own power and our own control over our circumstances, 
is not just our own spiritual health that can and will suffer. We will harm other people. Because the only way that we manage to cling to the illusion of power and control is by avoiding and shunting God out of the picture. And when we push God out of our lives, that will absolutely cause harm and hurt to the very people we're likely trying to love and care for by holding on so tight. The point of our faithfulness is never just for our own benefit. We live in the kingdom of God, a beloved community where we belong to one another. So what about you? Have you ever experienced a situation in your life where you've struggled to let go of power and control, where you have a sense that God may be calling you to approach your life differently, but it's just really hard to let go and trust him? Or maybe there's something in your life right now that resembles this dilemma. If you're struggling to let go of something, if you're clinging to power, if you've been pushing God off to the sidelines, I want to invite you to consider who else you might be harming by holding on so tight. One of the most simple and yet profound ways I've found to work through this, these kind of situations, is to pray this prayer. God, thank you for your faithfulness. I admit that I don't want what you want right now. Help me to desire the things that you want for me and give me the courage to be faithful to your truth. We may never see the full measure of the impact our faithfulness or our lack of faithfulness makes in the world. When things get challenging in life, we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're capable of measuring all the costs and benefits of our various choices. And we can rationalize our way into avoiding the hard yet faithful path. We can so easily convince ourselves precisely into the opposite path that Jesus wants us to take. This happens when we resist going to God in prayer honestly and with a posture of thanksgiving. Often, when we don't want to do that, it's because we don't want to admit to ourselves or to God what it is that we truly want. Because deep down we know that if we admit, if we admit that in the presence of our God, who we know is truly sovereign, it's likely going to require something costly from us. For me, it cost me control over my reputation and the position of power and influence. But letting go also came with a deep sense of peace and freedom. It's difficult to articulate, but there is a levity and a profound joy that comes with knowing I'd been faithful, even though it wasn't easy, and I certainly took my time getting there. Paul gave up a life of acclaim, achievement, and status. And from a worldly perspective, it made no sense. But from a kingdom perspective, will you be the judge? Here we are, 2,000 plus years later, and Paul wrote nearly half the New Testament. He planted several of the churches that we read about in the New Testament. He was instrumental in moving the mission of God forwards, perhaps as much, if not more so, than any other human being not named Jesus likely has. And yet Paul didn't live to see most of his impact. He was martyred by the Roman Empire. He didn't live to see the profound generational influence that his choices, his faithfulness, and his willingness to endure hardship and praise God in the midst of it made. And yet here we are in 2024, learning from, being blessed by his emotional and spiritual maturity and faithfulness. So my encouragement and my prayer for you today is that if, or rather when, you find yourself tempted to cling to power and control, when you find yourself avoiding letting God into an area of your life that feels deeply painful or messy, that you would remember that we are beloved children of God, that we would go to God honestly in prayer with a posture of thanksgiving, and that we would know that God will draw near to us. And the God who draws near to us does not do so in a way that condemns us. He doesn't scorn us, but he loves us. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's trustworthy. God wants you to live in and with the peace that transcends all understanding. As Paul wrote, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, 
whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Church, you can do all things through him who gives you strength, through Christ who strengthens you. You are not alone. God is with you, and God is for you. Amen. Friends, as we respond to the invitation to let go of control and to lean into God's care, is the Holy Spirit inviting you to be released from a sin in your life? Is there something that's overwhelming you, causing you to lose sleep or sow seeds of discord? As you confront this painful place, are you trying to fix it by controlling it? I would invite you to confess this to God now, just acknowledging that your own control is failing. But know that you don't confess to a God that would punish you for that, but rather a God who loves you and wants you to live in freedom. Now, having confessed individually, let's turn with one voice saying, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. People of God, God sees you, God knows you, and God loves you. Your sin is forgiven through Jesus, that you may live life to the fullest. Thanks be to God. Amen. We join together now at the table, a place where our Savior modeled for us that trusting God is an act of letting go of control and stepping into the full trust of God's providence. Because Jesus ate at a table with a bunch of imperfect people, all of whom doubted him at one point or even betrayed him. And Jesus still looked on them with love. Some gospel accounts note how he served them by washing their feet at this meal. Jesus, the Son of God, could have controlled everything in his life. And yet in this meal, we are reminded that Jesus gave up control and chose to suffer so that the whole of the world could be brought back into a perfect relationship with God. Friends, this is Jesus' body, the bread of life, which is given in love for you. And this cup is his blood, the blood of a promise that God made and kept for you to make it explicit that you are a part of God's family. So friends, may this meal nourish and strengthen you so that you can live in the trust that God has equipped you to serve, just like Jesus. If you're with others today, take a moment to serve each other. And if you're worshiping by yourself, remember that you belong to the greater body. We all belong to each other through the grace of God. And so as we go from this time, receive this benediction. Go into the world as people fully known and fully loved by God. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you always. Now I'll go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.